Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Prudent Observations. I've got a great show lined up for you all today. I am joined by colleagues, intelligent individuals, and uh, fellow appreciators of geography and strategy. I'm joined by Mr. Raging Mandrill and Mr. Semi Agog. Uh, Mr. Mandrill, how are you? I'm doing very well today. Thanks, Prude. And Semi Agog, how are you, sir? I am, uh, I, am, uh, I am ready to dive into this fascinating subject. Thanks very much for having me on. Uh, as always, you're one of my uh, favorite people to have on in that respect. So I, I thought, why not have a, my favorite people to discuss geography and strategy with? So uh, to get started, I guess I should probably bring out the context as to why this subject interested me. I was telling Mr. Mandrill off air that this has nothing, my, my interest in this topic had at first nothing to do with China, had nothing to do with U.S. Asiatic policy. It had everything to do with a bookmarked article that I had on my Twitter account about um, the uh, the Suez Canal having that blockage about a year or so ago, and now how everyone was worried that such a thing could happen again. And one of the places that they were very concerned about was the Strait of Malacca. And being a, a channel that covers geography and conflict and politics, uh, like every good American, I decided to start learning some geography by studying how likely this place might be used in conflict, uh, to reference Mark Twain there. Uh, and so we're going to talk about this lovely little place, which is right in between Malaysia and Indonesia, um, one of the busier parts of international trade. And we're going to talk about why it's important, not just on the global economic scale, but also the implications that this would have for great power politics in Southeast Asia and um, some of the territorial claims and disputes and piracy in the region as well. So uh, any initial thoughts or observations that either of you gentlemen might have before we just get on into it? Well, speaking of uh, shenanigans and, and bad stuff happening in the Strait of Malacca, if everybody remembers back uh, from 2017, the the USS John McCain uh, had a collision with a uh, merchant tanker in and around the Straits of Malacca, I believe. Um, and as a result, uh, 10 U.S. Navy sailors were killed in that collision. So, uh, yeah, something to bear in mind going forward. Mm. And yeah, I guess that underscores the observation that it's an extremely high traffic area, but I expect that you will uh, cover that. So I'll, I'll just wait and uh, ride along for the moment. All right. Well, uh, yes. So as we were, as we sort of referenced it last week, the, uh, the Malacca Strait or the Strait of Malacca, narrow water channel and one of the most strategic and also one of the busier shipping lanes in the world. Uh, it is amid the eastern coast of Sumatra and the western shore of the Malay Peninsula. I will have a lovely map that is brought up on here, courtesy of Mr. Mandrill, that we can dive into and discuss. Let me go share screen and we will just dive right on into this. So um, right here, if I can make sure that we have it all right there to the right, perfect. Um, you can see it right here, this little narrow bit in between Sumatra Island of Indonesia and then right there of the Malay Peninsula. This is one of the narrower and busier um, international shipping lanes. There's also a great concern about international piracy in the area and also a large surrounding bits of territory. So you have the Andaman Islands, the Nicobar Islands claimed by India to the south. You've got the Cocos, the Christmas Islands. Uh, you've got Australia just right down below. Um, and so you're in this midst of nations that have an interesting relationship. Again, see, we have China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, a large area in which the United States, China, and numerous other great powers have been interested in their own international uh, shipping affairs and whatnot. But this is actually one of the um, busiest parts for Chinese shipping and international uh, trade with respects to China. In fact, roughly um, Forty percent of their oil imports come through here when it comes on shipping containers, and of course, this is on top of ongoing predictions, according to the Wilson Center, that by 
um, 20, 30, 80% of uh, foreign oil will be around 80% in terms of Beijing's dependency. Uh, 80% of it travels by tanker through the Indian Ocean by the Malacca Straits, and 40% of all global shipping passes through this strait as well. So there's a, a large concern uh, to ensure that there aren't blockages, that there isn't uh, any sort of instances of piracy, although there's been numerous instances of that according to the literature I was reading. And you now have, on top of this, a Chinese policy on the People's Liberation Army Navy to introduce a new element of its naval doctrine called Far Seas Protection, uh, which details their intention to become a blue water force capable of defending China's sea lines of communication, SLOC, beyond the Western Pacific. Um, this, of course, means uh, acquis you know, acquisition of basing facilities in sub-Saharan Africa and other Asiatic countries. So you're beginning to see this very important shipping lane be an area of grave concern, not just for international economics, but also for China's own naval security for its own national security. So I think that's a good outline for us to start looking at here. Yeah, uh, could I uh, throw yeah, by a all couple means. of observations? One is that, um, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Prude, uh, and no doubt you as well, Mandrel, um, with your background. But just for our audience, there are uh, two other very, very important straits that have to be considered in this context. They're marked here on the map. The one is the uh, the Strait of Sunda. Um, I guess it's probably Indonesian there where it says it's Selat Sunda. Um, and the other one is uh, Lombok, which is uh, right there down at the bottom in the center. Um, and that's the uh, Lombok Strait. And those are two, um, they're considered two alternatives. Uh, particularly for uh, for China in terms of, uh, you know, alternate routes they could take if uh, the Straits of Malacca were blocked. Um, the, the thing is that there are some, some details uh, about them. The first one is that uh, the Sunda Strait is uh, shallower, uh, much shallower, and more difficult to uh, navigate for large ships. And I even understand it can present problems for uh, submarines. Um, but I'm not, you know, don't don't quote me on that. But the, um, the, the other one, the Strait of Lombok is actually very deep, uh, and wide and is, uh, ideally suited for, you know, high volumes of traffic to, to pass through it, as I understand it. Um, the, the thing is that, uh, Indonesia takes it, uh, very seriously and, um, and, and they have a considerable military and a huge population, and, uh, they're one of the parties that has, uh, issues with, uh, China's, um, sort of, um, 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 what, what do you call it, uh, un, um, uncompromising attitude towards the South China Sea stuff. Uh, and as I recall, they recently moved their capital to the island of Borneo, if, I'm, if, if I've got that right, if I haven't messed up. And uh, that puts them there with that uh, Makassar Strait that runs down to uh, Lombok. And so it, it, that's a spot that could be closed to uh, China as well, depending on its relations with uh, Indonesia. So there are other routes that they could take out of there. Um, the, the thing is that, you know, it really depends on what kind of mood uh, Indonesia is in. Um, and also there's uh, Australia, which... Um, we got it. But presumably, China could go around Australia as well, um, which is a, a long way around, um, and they'd have to uh, they'd have to be um, having a good relationship, presumably, with the Australians for that to happen. There's two islands that uh, Prudential has mentioned: the Christmas Island and the Cocos. Um, they're small islands, and they're a super long distance from from uh, from Australia. Um, they uh, apparently are used at present. Um, I don't think that anybody officially announced this, but it, it seems pretty clear to everyone that they're um, forward observation or uh, um, aerial reconnaissance and surveillance um, stations there. There's uh, on one of those islands, as I recall, and on, on one of them, there's a, there's a we don't uh, officially admit it type um, submarine monitoring station i believe again i'm not i'm not positive about that but the point is that they could both be used particularly um relative to the uh strait of sunda to give um australia more of a say in terms of what's going on with those straits um but they are at a great distance and the submarines that the uh the australians have at present <clears throat> um well they run out of fuel 
um, which probably has a great deal to do with the new um, arrangements that have been made with the United States for Australia to acquire nuclear powered submarines, which will considerably extend their ability to get out there to these faraway places and stay out there. Um, and that probably has a great deal to do with the whole question of, um, you know, this area is a kind of barrier for China and the scenarios that they envision that might come down in the future. Before we get into the um, Sino-Indonesia relationship right here, um, Mandrel, is there anything that you wanted to add? Yes. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, uh, like Simiagog mentioned, there are uh, pretty you know, interesting limitations uh, to get through the Singapore Strait. Um, I did do some research prior to the stream about the so-called Malacca Max, right? There are... Um, international shipping company standards on how big a vessel can be in order to fit through uh, these straits. And I think it's probably worth mentioning to people just so they get an idea of scale of exactly how big these vessels are that are, are transiting through these very tight areas. Um, for reference, the Malacca Strait, especially at the narrowest point of the channel, is about uh, a mile, one and a half nautical miles uh, wide. So that's 3000 yards, um, which if you're familiar with football fields, that's like, you know, you know, you know, a couple hundred football fields or something. Well, the vessels that are transiting through this are uh, the so-called Malacca Maxes. The, they're 333 meters in length. That's just under 1100 feet long. Um, you have uh, vessels that are about 60 meters or 197 feet a beam. And they have a draft of 67.3 feet in terms of max draft. So these are big, big vessels, right? These are not, not small by any means, right? They dwarf like every other vessel, both Navy and, and merchant um, in every other era, right? Um, so just so everybody gets an idea of the scale of how big these vessels are in order to to transit through that that strait there um so you have massive massive vessels um and it's probably also worth noting that merchant vessels do not have um typically uh like controlled variable pitch propellers um so like from a naval engineering perspective uh they have one propeller one screw right and if you want to to go backwards you have to stop the screw the propeller right um 100 and then you have to get it to turn in the opposite direction if you want to get like stern way or or to go backwards and um and they have one rudder they're extremely um there's like no redundancy on these things at all um so literally when you see um, merchant traffic on the high seas, they are, once they get out of port, they will come up to, to speed. They will, um, transition from using a high octane version of fuel, which allows them their diesel engines typically to, uh, operate at, at slower speeds in, in transiting in and out of port. But once they actually get out in the open ocean, they come up to about 16 to 19 knots or so, and they stay there, Right they don't change their speed they just turn in order to avoid you know other you know ships and and to avoid you know land features and that sort of thing um so just imagine people who who can't slow down who, who or don't want to slow down because they have to use the more expensive fuel and they they can't really stop or go backwards and they're all transiting like you know 20 miles an hour 16 or 19 knots is like in the high seas Think of that as like going 60 miles an hour. It's like a freeway, okay? If you could imagine that. Like, you know, just because of the, the relative motion between different vessels, because their max speed is like, you know, just under 20 knots, like that's the version uh, nautically of, of going like the speed that you would on a freeway, basically, just to get, you know, people's mind in the right place and conceptualize these things. Um, so you have... Typically, in these really small, narrow arrows, you'll have things like they're uh, called traffic separation scheme, which is, okay, you have like a freeway, you have a, a invisible dividing line on one side where traffic is maneuvering uh, in one direction, and on the other side of that line, you'll have traffic that's 
maneuvering in the exact opposite direction, right? So you have like these ships that are transiting at like 20 knots a piece and they're, they're coming within, you know, a couple hundred yards of each other. And, you know, um, it's, it's very tight. It's not, it, it's not, um, it's not easy at all, uh, to get through these areas. It's very stressful sometimes. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's been a, quite a few collisions, uh, that you could reference in, in these very, very tight areas. Of course, uh, famously, um, you know, the, the Porter had, uh, a collision in the Strait of Hormuz a, uh, about a decade or two ago. Um, and the audio for that is available. If you want to hear what that, what that looks and sounds like, it feels like, um, it to be, actually seeing what a collision feels like in, in these tight areas. Um, so yeah, um, just so everybody gets a sense of scale, like these, these are not small ships and these are not small areas at all, or these are not large areas to transit through, I should say. Yeah. And I think that this also opens up sort of in the, in the comments, there was, uh, the, the point about Indonesia being one of the core non-alignment states during the cold war. And it is, or it was, I should say, that significantly changed. There was some reporting that was done earlier this year and sort of this um, battle to woo Indonesia, to which Beijing certainly does have the um, the uh, means to do so. I mean, the resource laid a nation of nearly 300 million, according to the New York Times, is a big prize in the strategic battle between the United States and China for influence in Asia. Um Earlier, of course, this year, uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had visited Indonesia or last year in November. He pressed his counterpart whether they would buy 36 American fighter jets. He left without an agreement uh, j- just days before the same Indonesian official, uh, Prabowo Subotano, met with the China's defense minister and the two countries pledged to resume joint exercises. Located in the southern edge of the South China Sea, Indonesia is a resource-laden nation with a fast-growing trillion-dollar economy and large population, and is a big prize for the geopolitical battle between Washington and Beijing for influence in Asia. Its strategic location, with 70,000 islands stretching thousands of miles of vital sea lanes, it is a defensive necessity as both sides gear up for a possible conflict over Taiwan, um, and both nations are pursuing its influence, um, both mainly for... Uh, large nickel deposits, as well as billions of dollars in foreign direct investment. During the coup, there was, of course, vaccine diplomacy in regards to whose vaccine they would take over who, uh, and they chose the Chinese. And this, of course, has led to um, $5 billion being invested in Indonesia from China in the first nine months of 2022, compared to around $2 billion at the same time for the United States. So this becomes an even more important strategic location in the backdrop of the Um, What we discussed last week, which was about the uh, Davidson window and the respect of any sort of conflict or confrontation over Taiwan between the United States and the um, People's Republic of China. And so those are important things to keep in mind in the backdrop of this discussion over the strait as well as uh, international shipping lanes. And another uh, point, if I can uh, quickly jump in. By all uh, means. True. Prude is that, um, and this is uh, from uh, Defense News, it's discussing, um, and and this is, what's the date on this? This is from uh, February of this year. Um, This is an article discussing the fact that Indonesia and Vietnam have uh, settled uh, dispute regarding their claims um, having to do with the South China Sea. Um, But uh, Indonesia has... um, has you know that w- w- which would cause you to imagine that having settled those disputes amongst themselves they would be in a position to present a stronger front to china uh, but this article is quick to note that um it's unlikely that this means that indonesia is going to get at all vocal uh, about um china's uh, south china sea uh, claims um and, and it, it notes here it says that um uh, Indonesia has often said it is not a party to the South China Sea disputes, um, although China's nine dash line claim to ownership of regional waters overlaps with uh, Indonesian EEZ claims north and uh, east of the latter's uh, Natuna Islands. Uh, China sent letters through diplomatic channels in 2021 demanding Indonesia stop drilling for oil and gas in waters where these claims overlap. Uh, according to a Reuters report. It had also sent Coast Guard and hydrographic survey vessels to monitor drilling activities. But the Indonesian government has not uh, commented uh, 
on the report, although it previously said it does not recognize China's nine dash line um, claims. And so the last bit here that's important, this is in line with Indonesia's tendency to play down disputes with China. Um, and, you know, as we could all imagine, the uh, the island nation depends heavily on trade with China, which is also Jakarta's largest source of foreign investment. Trade between the countries was valued at $78.5 billion in 2020, according to uh, China's Customs Service. So that would explain why Indonesia is unlikely to want to... Um, to, to you know get slapped with this the the, the stick and uh, deprived of the carrot that China is able to offer it yeah if I'm if I'm not mistaken to uh, if I remember correctly Malaysia and Indonesia don't they have uh, a significant Chinese minorities present there as well oh yeah huge just... uh, uh, yeah all over uh, Singapore uh, Malaysia Indonesia they're they're all over the place although not all of them who respond uh, on you know census censuses, I guess I could say, uh, and the like, um, call themselves uh, Chinese, but the numbers are, are huge. They're all over that area. And heavily yeah, in, in, in Malaysia alone, they're roughly, the last estimated report said they've made up almost a third of the Malaysian population, a variety of ethnic Han Chinese inside the country. Yeah. So, I mean, th that plays a large role in respects to this. But you mentioned, of course, the the nine, uh, the, the nine, da you know, the dash nine line there, and I think it's important to visualize what that looks like. So this is the uh, Chinese claim that is outlined in green. Um, so we can get this outlined over here. You've got everything all the way down to the James Shoal, close to Malaysia um, yeah, and that's, Indonesia. Sorry, that's um, just so everybody understands, that's about 24 nautical miles off the coast of Malaysia. So um, like we've mentioned before on the channel, you have the shoreline to 12 nautical miles is, is your, your actual territory. 12 to 24 nautical miles is your your contiguous zone where you can enforce your nation's laws. And then out to 200 miles is your exclusive economic zone. So what the Chinese are claiming is they're saying, oh, the entire exclusive economic zone of Malaysia uh, is in is in Chinese hands, basically, is what they're claiming here by, by the claim it, of James, the James and, Shoal. And for anyone who didn't like catch it, um, you know, it might be or who doesn't know it, it might be useful to look at um, a map of the wider area to see how far this extends down beyond anywhere that China is located. Like it just swings way south and, you know, you um, it, it's crazy. I mean, I, I mean I, here's the scale down below for this map, the one to, you know, um, I think it's like 12,800 here or something like, well, no one to like 12.8 billion, I think it's the scale. I mean, you got 400 miles down below. And I mean, we're talking from say even the part like just say you know high cow right and all the way down to here we're talking well over a thousand uh nautical miles down below in this distance um and this is also important to keep in mind in respects to these territorial claims and these sea line claims this is that unlike the united states uh china is a signatory member of the united nations convention on the law of the sea which is meant to govern international disputes and territorial claims over exclusive economic zones, territorial waters, and how far your EEZ stretches out past your coastline. Um, and this is a substantial shift in that direction. Um, so these, uh, you know, nine dash line claims here illustrate sort of the challenge to sort of the existing, um, you know, ex existing order in respects to the economic zones of other countries, but also in respects to U.S. foreign policy in this area, especially concerns over the Spratly Islands, uh, the Scarborough Reef, <laughs> Um, and their relationship with Taiwan, the Philippines, and the rest of the region, including Vietnam. Yeah, um, it's also in, of uh, interest to note here that um, the, the, this whole territorial claim over exclusive economic zone by the Chinese has been taken to, uh, I believe, the United Nations Maritime Court. Um, and of course, the Chinese did lost, lose that case, um, like in like 2016 or 2017. And they just don't care, you know, uh, they're still pressing that claim as if, you know, they hadn't lost a court case over it, um, which just shows you without the enforcement mechanism, you know, a great, a perceived great power that perceives it itself as an up and coming great power, or at least a, a very bare minimum or regional power, um, isn't going to, to back off of what it perceives as its rightful claims. 
Yeah, this was in the International Tribunal um, against Beijing's claim to much of the South China Sea. This is the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague back in July 12, 2016. So it's been a hot minute since. Uh, it'll be almost seven years in July. There's no evidence that China has exercised exclusive control historically over key waterways in relationship to the Philippines. Um, and although Rodrigo Duterte has had an awkward relationship, and I say that with the full intention of the word awkward, because both being you know, interested in its actions and relationships with China uh, and then going back and dealing more towards the United States, it seems he's been, of course, been at the time pushing more for a what who can offer the better deal type situation. Um, but of course, you know, this aspect of Beijing and Manila's relationship over the South China Sea still plays an important role in how the United States pushes itself towards uh, the Philippines, but also as well as with other countries like that of Indonesia, of Malaysia, and the Philippines. Although America has not had the world's best success under this administration with a relationship with Vietnam, um, we've really only sent Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin down there uh, with little to no meaningful um, deals or ramped up support between the two countries, um, despite the decades that have passed since hostilities between the two. But those are important things to keep in mind. And you also had sent me another pretty good uh, important thing for us to consider, which is the other agreed maritime boundaries on here, Mantral. Uh, you know, how much here do we think that we really need to know here? Because the H here is, of course, the, um, you know, the undefined claim, which also would be the, the nine dash line with Taiwan being included. Okay, but so go for uh, it. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me take it from here on this map. Um, so this is essentially a map which which delineates um, the past like 50 or 60 years of development in the South China Sea, right? Um, the nine dash line or Kaotung as it's called in, in uh, some circles and especially in China um, for its shape, obviously, because it looks like a massive tongue. It used to be called the 11 dash line because the Chinese also were making claims in, you know, Vietnam, right? In the Gulf of Tonkin, right? You can see this, this area A, right? Um, they actually fought a war uh, after the United States exited uh, Vietnam in the late seventies over 1979. That. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the, I think the Vietnamese actually, um, won that conflict. Um, they got what they wanted and the Chinese didn't. Um, so it, it, instead of becoming the 11 dash line, it becomes the nine dash line. Right. Um, and so you can see, um, the Spratleys right there outlined, you can see the outline of the exclusive economic zone around the Natuna islands that semi got previously mentioned, um, also, to complicate this picture, you have the very, very small nation of Brunei, and you can see um, in labeled uh, D, E, and K right there, that's the um, uh, the uh, their national waters in D, their continuous uh, zone in E, and then their uh, delineated exclusive economic zone out in E, right? Literally just a massive straight out into the sea, um, which is what they their claim to the ocean is right um and of course the chinese claim obviously because you can see that they claim everything down to the james shoal uh 24 nautical miles off the coast of malaysia um they're they're basically claiming the exclusive economic zones of the philippines they're claiming the economic zone uh and also part of the con continuous zone and the, the like the national waters of brunei they're also claiming Indonesia and to some extent Vietnam's economic zone as well. And to, like, I guess you could probably say also Indonesia with that little area that clips the northeastern economic zone around the Natuna Islands. So there's a lot of different countries here that China's maximalist uh, economic claim is going to piss off, right? Um, so. <laughs> this is where grand strategy of the United States comes into play, right? Um, being on good relations with all of these countries is in the United States's interest. Um, and if you think about um, China and what they're doing, um, what do they do typically is they, they like for example, Scarborough reef and the Spratly islands, they fortify these places. They, find some coral reef or some shallow shoal, dump a couple hundred thousand, you know, tons of sand on it, pave it, put a barracks 
detect an airfield, uh, a, a dock maybe, a, and you know, surface-to-air missile and anti-ship cruise missile batteries, and call it a day, and just like you know, make it a note uh, an area access denial weapon, right. Right? an unsinkable aircraft carrier, is, as people like to describe islands. Um, and so they're doing that in in these areas, in you know, the Scar Scarborough Reef, Spratly Islands, etc. And you know, just basically saying, oh no, this is our territory now. Um, there have been notable um, confrontations, especially with the Philippines, um, because like uh, Radlib has mentioned on his channel, the Chinese just, their arable land is mostly on their coastline and that's being developed over the past 60 years. So where are the Chinese going to get the food to feed their population? Um, well, they're going to get it from the ocean, right? And so this is where if you're a population of 1.2 billion and you have a bunch of hungry mouths to feed, okay, well, where are you going to find the fish if, you know, the waters by China are all fished out? Where are you going to go to the Philippines, right? Um, or you're going to go down to Malaysia. And that's why they're making these maximalist claims on um, on a logistical and, and uh, you know, food level, basically subsistence level. All right. Uh, Sammy Gog, is there anything that you want to add to this? Uh, no, not to uh, specific considerations regarding the claims um, to the South China Sea, but um, it, I, it would be interesting to look at the ways in which uh, the United States is seeking to uh, flex in this area uh, that, that uh, Mandrill alluded to, you know, in terms of working with allies and maintaining those relationships, adding, uh, the Philippines back into the mix again, uh, recently, had you, had you planned to cover any of that? Oh, there's some of the, I, I also wanted to focus on the international shipping, but yes, I, I, I definitely do want to get into those as well. Um, all right, well, I'll wait and we'll, we'll just see where it goes. Sure. Um, I, I was given a, a pretty good image uh, earlier today from uh, our friend who works in logistics, Mr. Christopher Sambet, just to sort of compare and contrast the international shipping density, just to give a comparison. So these images were taken, you know, a little screenshot about an hour ago. Uh, the one on the right, of course, is the Panama Canal and um, sort of the Central and South America international shipping and then on the left, you have the Strait of Malacca alongside the other two straits in the region as well. So you've got a very busy place for international shipping and traffic, not on top of just the um, uh, issue of a potential what is called the, the Malacca dilemma, whether they are um, to have any sort of uh, blockages or, of course, security concerns. Um, but you also have to have significant issues with uh, international trade and piracy. There's been over 70 cases in um, armed piracy and robbery, um, although this has been significantly reduced through international efforts at combating shipping piracy, primarily both from India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and China. This has been one of the few areas where there has been multinational cooperation in reducing uh, international piracy alongside the Malacca Strait. Um, and these sort of things also possess... Uh, and the reason why a lot of these ships are targeted is because the... Um, boat identification area, the, the automatic identification system um, isn't on a lot of the smaller vessels such as tugboats or um, lighter craft that you would need to assault or to board a, a much larger shipping vessel or um, cargo ship. So you've got quite a bit there going on in regards to the economic interests as well as the security one. There's also a fun little bit of uh, geography at play here that I think is really important for us to consider where... Um, you know, natural disaster, of course, is a, is a great concern because uh, according to the 40% um, of global trade comes through one of these uh, routes, of course, over 90,000 ships pass every year. Uh, and at the same time, though, you also have got uh, the grave concern of that's a nice uh, shipping lane you've got here. It'd be a real shame if something were to happen to it. Um, and this isn't, of course, just respects to... Uh, <laughs> aircraft or um, sh uh, shipping containers and boats hitting one another. 
uh, but it also has to do with uh, natural disasters as well, which is one of the, um, the most important things that there is there. Uh, one of the greatest menaces to the Malacca Strait, according to the BBC, which separates the Malay Peninsula from the Indonesian island of Sumatra, lie in the natural world. One of the most intriguing maps and of activities in the region is the uh, one that collates the world's most active volcanoes and recent earthquakes. Along the coast of Sumatra and the other southerly part of Java, following the course of the Sunda Trench, is a band of earthquake activity and several volcanoes. And I'm going to go zoom in on that map real quick so you all can get a look at what I what I'm seeing here as well. So, um, alrighty, we'll share this tab instead here. So just in this area alone, you've got a major, um, volcanic chain. You have, of course, a, um, 4.0 magnitude, just earthquake that happened off Southern Sumatra just an hour ago. You've got two other active volcanoes and one that's a little partially, uh, un currently inactive, so things like that that are currently happening with minor activity and large ones, the grave concern also would be, how does the natural world imply here? I mean, one can only think back to 2004's tsunami. These sort of things happen mm. on a regular occurrence day in and day out. So, you know, the international concern that isn't just affecting international, like national security of, say, China or anyone's economy, is that you also have to deal with, you know, tectonic plate activity, earthquakes, tsunamis, and other natural disasters. And I just think that this is an important thing to consider, um, considering that this is one of the more active areas. It's within the ring of fire. And uh, of course, plate tectonics seems to be our, our current active understanding of how the world works in that respect. So things to keep in mind. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the the volcano uh, a bit too. Um, this is the region of the world that Krakatoa famously exploded in, in 1882, in the 1880s. Um, and uh, like, just think of you have this this these choke points in these straits, right? That you're trying to get naval shipping through, and oh look, all of a sudden you have like a forest fire or a volcanic explosion that suddenly massively reduces visibility and forces uh, the shipping that's in that channel or trying to get through that channel to to slow down, right? Um, because you can't see where you're going. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, just just makes it difficult to get through. Yeah, one thing that I definitely wanted to to bring up was certainly that. But um, in respects to sort of the the greater geopolitical situation, I mean, yes, there's Indonesia that's also being looked into. Um, but the three other larger parties that I wanted to keep in mind would be the Philippines, India, and Australia, which of course by extension includes the Quad and sort of that American naval interest is there as well. Um, most recently, of course, has been the relationship between the Philippines and China. Um, earlier, say during the Trump administration, you had saw sort of this, who can I get the best deal out of the sort of flip flopping back and forth over disputed territory, uh, international aid, and of course, whether or not the American military presence in the area can still stay within the country. Uh, however, more recently, those positions have certainly changed. The differences in the South China Sea, um, of course, are not supposed to be the end all be all of the Philippine, uh, Filipino China relationship here. Uh, most recently, just last month on April 22nd, the Philippines foreign minister had said that the nation's differences with China and the South China Sea are not the sum total relations between the two countries. These differences should not prevent us from seeking ways of managing them effectively, especially with respect to enjoyment of the rights of Filipinos, especially fishermen. Philippine Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo had said in the start of bilateral talks in Manila with his Chinese partner, counterpart, King Gang. The Philippines has previously raised diplomatic protests at the presence of Chinese fishing vessels and what China calls aggressive actions in the strategic waterway. Uh, Kin Chin said on Saturday that China is ready to work with the Philippines and implement a consensus between the two countries and properly resolve differences. China claims sovereignty almost over the entire South China Sea, which sees the passage of about three trillion dollars worth of shipborne annually goods or shipborne goods annually, and is believed to be rich in minerals and oil and gas deposits. Uh, and of course, back in 2016, the Permanent Court of Arbitration of the Hague invalidated these claims. Um, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Brunei, Indonesia, and the Philippines also have complete competing claims in the waterway, which we were looking at earlier with the uh, map that Mandrill had uh, showed us, which is sort of the history of territorial disputes, exclusive economic zones, and the rest. So this area really does remain one of the most uh, important economic waterways, but also illustrates the long-standing territorial and historical disputes between Asiatic countries within the region. But yeah, uh, by all means, gentlemen, if there's anything else to add here. 
Oh, no, Mantra, I'm not putting up an ethnic joke. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, yeah, uh, so the in- other interesting thing from a naval perspective to note here um, on the map is the difference in terms of submarine uh, warfare and the distinctions between nuclear powered and diesel powered submarines. Um, diesel powered submarines, uh, are an old technology. They've been around for a while. They have, they have uh, severe limitations, but they're cheaper and, and they require less of, a um, of a higher tech knowledge base to operate and maintain. Um, but their limitations are that they're underwater. They are very slow right there. They don't move quick. They're like, you know, a couple of knots, um, And it's very much an old school World War II era technology. But that doesn't mean that they are useless militarily. Um, And I want to touch on this because Australia um, was supposed to get uh, diesel submarines from, I think, France. Yes, and then we sort of said screw you with the AUKUS agreement. Yes, yes. And then the United States basically was like, well, no, fuck that. You're going to get you're going to get nuclear submarines. Um, nuclear submarines, uh, have their benefits. Um, they are, they don't have to refuel. Um, they don't have to resurface for air every so often. Um, that old World War II technology where diesel submarines have to, you know, come up to the surface every 24 hours. Um, there's, there's technology that exists now that, that somewhat mitigates that. Um, but, um, the, the thing with, uh, nuclear submarines is that while they have the the speed advantage over diesels and they have the the range advantage um and you know the only thing limitation there is you know you know food for the crew basically um in terms of how long you can be out on on you know operational maneuvers um diesel submarines are uniquely uh, useful in areas where there are choke points right you don't use these things as like a long range um you know missile platform or something that can go you know long ranges quickly to a certain place no you want it as an ambush hunter and you just think okay i have if i have a fleet of diesel submarines where am i going to use them well you're going to use them in the Strait of Malacca, you're going to use them in the Lombok Strait, you're going to use them in the Sunda Strait, and you're going to use them in all of these little islands and straits that are in this entire region. Um, And, of course, this is important to note as well, because who else has diesel submarines? India has kilo-class diesel submarines inherited from the Soviets. China has kilo-class diesel submarines inherited from the Soviets. Um... You know, um, and of course, Australia has diesel submarines that they have built themselves. So um, this is where if, you know, you, ASW is so incredibly important because, um, you know, you need these sorts of like ambush platforms in order to to like deny access to shipping or to make um, uh, sending your merchant fleet through these areas incredibly hazardous. Right. And this goes back to, again, the United States is in NATO's general strategy. Um, if you have an, uh, an enemy country that you can conduct a successful guerre de scar, or excuse me, a guerre de course, right, a commerce war against, because they have no choice but to send the majority of their, you know, necessary black gold through all of the little straits in there that you can easily cut off, well, then why wouldn't you do that? Right. It doesn't make any sense to try to have a knockdown drag out fight with China in their home turf where they've, you know, basically made all of these little islands. So if I was the United States, I, it would really require the ability to to change your naval planning here. And, um, you know, why would you go toe to toe with the Chinese in their own stomping grounds by Taiwan if they decided to invade? Why wouldn't you just decide to sink all their merchant shipping? And to that point, uh, the United States does have a plan for that. Um there have been, um, of course, they call this the string of pearls theory. That's the American name for, you know, the the uh, Sea Road Initiative, right? Uh, the the Sea, yeah, the, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. That's part of the Belt and Road. Uh, this is what the United States government calls that, the, that half of the Belt and Road. Um, and they have a counter to it. And their counter is called um, just making 
um, the fourth and fifth island chain, right? So for everybody's essay, you have the first island chain, which is, you know, close to uh, mainland Asia, which includes Japan, like the Kuril Islands, the Philippines, Taiwan, and all that. And you have a second island chain that extends a little bit further out, um, you know, with like, obviously... It includes um, Guam. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you have a third island chain, which is like, you know, the Aleutian or in Hawaii and Midway and, and out, out in Fiji and out, out in the like mid of the Pacific, right? So the fourth and fifth island chain is a way for the United States to um, you know, cut off access of China to, um, to its oil supplies from Africa and the Middle East. And so you have in India, right? You have the, uh, this island string that goes down along the west coast of India, right? Uh, the southwest Andaman tip of India. And... Oh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. No, no, I'm not Andaman. Got... Right. Andaman, Andaman is owned, and, and the Nicobar Islands are owned by India, which before you, uh, we, Prude and I were talking in, in, before the show started about this area, because if you're the United States and you know that all of Chinese oil has to go through the Strait of Malacca, like it is very unwise for you as, as a NATO power to piss off India or to prevent India to get any, to, to like make life difficult or inconvenient for them in any single way. You want the Indians to do to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands what the Chinese have done to the Spratly Islands, right? You want them to build, like I said before, uh, uh, a barracks, a pier, uh, airfield, and salmon and anti-ship missile batteries, right? You want to make and sure it, this and area is a no-go they're doing zone. that. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah, indeed, yeah. India is finally doing that now. Yes. But the United States also has, has an additional plan, right? Because there's islands uh, to the west of the tip of India, like Diego Garcia, um, they also have an air base in, um, in, uh, shoot, what are, it, it's in Djibouti. I can't remember the name. Oh, I think it's like Dulaman or something. Um, and they also have another place by, uh, Madagascar, which is, I think the, the Coromon Islands. Um, right. And, and the so, one in Djibouti is, is right next to the Chinese one. And all mm-hmm. of the anti-piracy efforts in that zone could easily be turned into a kind of interdiction program against China as well. But sorry, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly the plan, right? This is the United States' counter to the uh, road part of the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Um, and so, really, what you're what you're doing is is that's that's the, really that's the best strategy that the United States could come up with is why would you even fight the Chinese toe to toe in the South China Sea? You don't even need to do that. Like you could fight them closer to Indonesia and Australia, where you're closer to allied nations, you can go get, it's easier to go get resupply, you can go, you know, to Australia or Indonesia or any of these other allied countries that don't like China. Um, And you could maybe convince them to be on your side if China decided to, you know, be an aggressive power in Southeast Asia. Um, And it means that you reduce your supply lines in East Asia, right? So you're forcing the Chinese to to participate in their own form of, of um, uh, almost expedi- naval expeditionary warfare, right? So you're forcing them to send their ships into the Indian Ocean, into, you know, the Java Sea, right? Um, and to fight there as opposed to fighting in areas where, oh, look, I've already built up the Spratly Islands. I've already put... You know, right, air anti-access, and missile defense area battery. denial. Right. Yeah, all of those, all of those weapons that are very difficult for a, an American navy to to take out, right, um, or to neutralize. So you're just saying, okay, I'm going to ignore all of this stuff. Like, why would you not fight in in an area like by the Andaman Islands and just basically fight a, a guerre de course and force China? You know, because the Chinese advantage in this in this fight is its its industry, it's in its ability to construct new ships. Whereas the American weakness is to is is in its inability to construct and repair ships, right? Compared to the Chinese, so how do you how do you get rid of the Chinese's industrial capacity? You cut it off from from fuel, you cut it off from gas, you cut it off from resources like um, and cut and cut off their economy entirely. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly, and you force you force the Chinese to come to terms that way. Um, so fighting a, a gear discar, which is a a, a War of annihilation in naval terms is not in the United States' best interest um, at this at this point, um, considering what the Chinese have already done. Like it, it's one thing to go and to fight, you know, send your little carrier from Japan, your carrier strike group, and go fight over Taiwan. 
but you'll lose that carrier and you only have like 10 more of them. And it's going to take the other ones like a couple months to get into this region. But after you've done that, um, and you know, once the initial shock has worn off on the Chinese, like, it, you know, cause that's unexpected for the Americans to do that. But then you really should start to fight in this area down here where you might be able to have more sympathetic powers and, and where the Chinese, you know, it becomes, this becomes a, de- a defensive zone that is very difficult for the Chinese to, to have their fleet penetrate without being um, destroyed themselves in turn, right? Um, so that makes a lot more sense to force the Chinese to have to defend their merchant traffic in places that are further away from the Chinese mainland. Um, and so, uh, a new a new fleet of nuclear powered submarines uh, for the Australians would make that job a whole lot easier for the United States and its allies. The problem is that this is against the background, as you pointed out, of their uh, um, their routes across um, the the uh, across Asia, their land routes, you know, which are an alternative thing for them. So it's very very interesting to consider um, what you're talking about here in terms of. Um, uh, an oblique or a, a less direct anyway strategy for dealing with the uh, Chinese in this uh, kind of uh, scenario uh, at sea. It's interesting to look at what's been done by the Biden administration on land because these two think aspects must be considered together. You've got the Belt and Road idea with a string of pearls uh, explicitly understood as two arms of the same project by the Chinese. We, we should certainly understand them in that way too. But Biden came along and did precisely uh, what would uh, drive Russia and China together Uh, ensuring that China would be able to get energy and also have overland trade routes to do shipping. Uh, Biden um, pulled out of uh, uh, Afghanistan entirely, not even keeping the air base in Bagram. Um, And so, uh, at least in theory, the Chinese can transit overland there, although, of course, it's not stable. Um, And uh, and by pushing uh, China and Russia together, um, uh, China's uh, m- many of China's uh, energy concerns can be addressed with overland delivery that's not susceptible to naval interdiction. Uh, Biden also uh, drove uh, Russia entirely into the arms of uh, Iran, which it had previously kept a distance from so as not to piss off the various Western countries. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's supporting and uh, further arming Iran which works out perfectly for the Chinese because then they can move through Iran on their way towards uh, Europe. Um, So Biden himself has done a a series of things that there's so many of them one after the other that it can't be considered, at least by me, uh, a matter of coincidence to undermine uh, the strategy that he pretends to be following uh, vis-a-vis Taiwan and taking a more bristly stance towards China in the in the South China Sea. I, I think it's all I think it's all a mummer's farce. I think it's all smoke and mirrors in this region. Simply because if the United States really did want to be able to uh, threaten uh, China more effectively, they just shot out half of their strategy. And you know um, it, it, uh, the U.S.'s strategy for blocking them over land which makes all of the things that they could do at sea less effective. Yeah, that's true. Um, and of course, on the oil issue, right, it's it's not impossible for China to to counter uh, any sort of restriction strategy of the United States of, of closing off, you know, naval shipping traffic through the Strait of Malacca. Um, you know, you can go around on land, but that requires things like infrastructure and pipelines and, and you know, trucks and all of that sort of stuff that, that you know, you'd have to build and you'd have to invest in. Um, right, it takes time. And, 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 and it's it's fixed and easier to destroy, which is a good point you're making. Yeah, and of course, uh, like you mentioned before, um, like and like I've mentioned before, uh, pissing off India w- in regards to Russia. I mean, you just, you have a very easy, you know, choke point with the Andaman and Nicobar Islands with India's controlling them. So the fact that you are now, um, and this isn't to say that the Indians don't like, dislike the Chinese. Um, but like, if you're, if you're ensuring that, you know, India is, finds this whole Russia thing inconvenient, it, it's, it becomes more difficult in the future to convince India to 
you know, be a military ally with you in any hypothetical conflict with China, right? Which, of course, if you want to close off the Strait of Malacca, how do you close off a strait? Well, you close it off at both ends, right? So you need the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and then you need some kind of naval thingamajig in, in you know, the, the Singapore Strait at the other end. Um, and so if you don't have these two areas, you're, you're losing uh, this area right here. And I would imagine um, your, your fallback is, is, of course, like places like Diego Garcia and, and the Horn of Africa stuff that they're doing uh, over there. Um, so that's, that's kind of like a mitigation measure to my mind. Um, but yeah, I would say any, any sort of plan that you have in order to reduce Chinese economic prospects through the Strait of Malacca, you need the Andaman and Nicobar Islands to be, to be in your hands. So like making things inconvenient for India because of, of Russian sanctions or demanded Russian sanctions is probably not smart. (laughs) So, yeah. And, and of course, if you wanted to, like you mentioned, hypothetically have a war with China, you need to make sure at minimum Russia is neutral and is not providing uh, material support. So, you know, at this point, Russia, if, if China went to war with the United States for whatever reason, uh, Russia probably could be convinced, you know, quid pro quo to provide material support to China. Right. So, you know, the other thing that also needs to be considered when we talk about say India's part in all of this, of course, is the, uh, relationship that it has itself outside of the context of the United States has, of course, its own issues with respects to to China. You have um, a long-standing territorial border disputes between the country, uh, the two nations, and then on, on side of this, you also have the growing concern about what the uh, what you called the um, string of pearls uh, strategy with respects to the Chinese. Um, and you know, this is also a concern to uh, India's own territorial sovereignty. Uh, and this, of course, has to deal with the fact that the, you know, a lot of a major chunk of its trade passes through the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, things that include, of course, you know, the Strait of Malacca, the Lombok Strait, Strait of Hormuz. Um, you know, India would probably view it in three major areas for concerns, uh, endangering Indian maritime security, especially as China continues to develop more sea power and to um, have parity, if not uh, increase the number of ships it has as blue water ships compared to the United States Navy. Um, and that, of course, will be a concern, I think, if I were an Indian policy planner. Uh, the impact towards the economy, of course, this means that Indian resources are going to be directed towards uh, national defense. Um, you could potentially hamper economic growth there as you redirect more of your um, government revenues towards security spending. And then, of course, uh, strategic clout may be reduced, which means, uh, you know, if China has more openings in the India Ocean and it enjoys a stronger relationship with neighboring neighboring countries, whether that be Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, etc., um, then I would be certainly concerned to see how much my relationship with the West is to be put into question here. Um, now, there's been discussion about what would be called a necklace of diamonds, uh, this was mentioned several years ago in a policy uh, discussion about the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, uh, was that you wanted to see a greater influence upon what can India do in the region. And of course, this is not even including the Quad or its relationship with, say, Japan, Australia, uh, or the United States. But I mean, you would want to have important agreements with those respective countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, South Korea, Indonesia, and Singapore. Um, and of course, build up access ports as well. I mean, this has happened already, uh, including the Adaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, India's built a deep water port in Sitwe, uh, Myanmar, Burma, back in 2016. Um, and so you're, you're beginning to witness some sort of strategic defense autonomy be brought up by the Indian government. Uh, but at the same time, right, like you the United States has to play this delicate balancing act. And I don't think it's been doing a very good job of this with respect to the conflict in Ukraine um, while pissing off one of the quote unquote world's largest democracies as the U S uh, state department likes to tout with its relationship to India. Um, Semya Gaga, I know that you wanted to focus a lot on this subject of where would the USG put its influence in? Um, I was wondering what you might have to add here. Well, not a lot because I did uh, I did throw in some there, and uh, Mandrill covered uh, quite a bit of it. I just throw in 
I mean, Mandrel was basically saying this, um, but I want to make it explicit for our viewers, the whole business with uh, pissing off India and, uh, you know, to whatever extent and making it at all less likely that they'd be willing to uh, play ball uh, with us in using the Andaman and uh, Nicobar Islands as a way to cut things off. It's just another example of how the Biden administration has done, you know, and not just screwing up the overland routes, but the, the sea routes. So yeah, just explicitly underlining that all this fits together and does suggest that the, uh, the Biden administration, despite all its protestations, just weirdly and strangely continues to do things that really help China. Um, but I, I would add, since this isn't that that isn't the subject of the stream, um, to your point, uh, Prude, with uh, other things about India, I would just add in uh, Sri Lanka, because um, that is a place where uh, China has been making uh, greater uh, and greater inroads. And uh, that's historically a place where India obviously has a lot of interests. Um, and so keeping uh, India uh, on board in that respect could be very, very important in future. If, uh, if the, uh, if something went down with a, with a war with China, because, you know, uh, Mandrel mentioned that we've got, uh, on lease from Britain, Diego Garcia, but, uh, Sri Lanka is at, at, at a minimum, um, an economic, you know, civil, uh, logistics supply chain, you know, refueling, um, and you know waypoint for the chinese before they make it over to the uh the coast of Af africa um and if india isn't on board um th that that's a powerful in influence and lever historically to affect uh things in sri lanka that the the us would lose um there's also the business with the philippines that should be thrown in uh with the recent negotiations that have been done uh, the united states is now in a position to um to do some things with uh bases um uh in uh in the philippines as well that's just prude pulling up a map there showing um uh sri lanka or ceylon or whatever and its importance uh as a waypoint um, but the Philippines is another angle on this. They don't have uh, an army of any sort that could be expected to do much of anything at all uh, against China. And the Philippine uh, Navy is enormous, but it's uh, it's just lots of more uh, tiny um, crafts. Um, it's not like any kind of, you know, it's, it, they've got thousands of islands in the, the Philippine archipelago. Um, yeah. But it's not not like they have uh, um, you know lots of cruisers and and aircraft carriers or anything. So for yeah. the United States, it's not as though the Philippines is uh, is a great ally in terms of being able to throw its own weight at China. But it gives us access to bases right there on the edge of that nine dash line area. So that was another one to throw in. So yeah, India and sorry, man, draw. I'll hand it over to you. But India. Um, uh, and its importance and the way we seem to be dropping the ball with that lately, uh, the Philippines being brought back online. Um, and then the business with the sub deal with Australia all seem to be, uh, attempts to bring, um, uh, new, new, uh, ways to apply, uh, pressure, um, to bear on the situation. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump here. Thanks. Thanks, Simiak. Um, Yeah, so uh, the first thing on on the Philippines and having, you know, uh, a navy of essentially small craft is the Chinese also do have a um, the, their own version, which is the uh, Chinese maritime militia, which they've been involved in like little fishing disputes and, and you know, little spats and things in the South China Sea so far. Um, but if you want to look at what that conflict hypothetically would look like it's not going to look like the falklands it would look more like um that the whole situation with uh the tamils uh back in like the 80s uh and, and you know against you know india and, and all of that um um you can look up the combat footage for that uh like they they basically their navy fought a small craft war with lots of like suicide craft and and it's just a nasty nasty conflict um you know, inter-ethnic conflict in, in Ceylon. Um, and you can see the combat footage and like, there's just dudes on like 
you know, a small craft with a 50 cal machine gun and, you know, shooting at each other and, you know, people getting hit with, you know, machine gun rounds and have blood on the deck and all that just nasty stuff. Um, but, um, I think it's probably, um, worth mentioning, um, since Oliver kind of mentioned the, the Chinese counter to the American strategy here. And one of the counters, um, that China could use to uh, maybe avoid, uh, being choked off at the Strait of Malacca is um, the proposed uh, canal that would be built on the uh, Mal- Malaysian Peninsula, specifically, if I remember correctly, in, in Thailand. Yeah, uh, it's the most of Thailand, the Kral Canal, but it's on. Yes. Uh, it's strategically ambiguous at this point. There's no indication of whether it's uh, still going go- going to happen or being planned or not. And I think we have to look at the the Thai election. Didn't a, an election just happened happen, or is it about to happen? Sorry. Mm. Yeah, um, I I don't know anything about Thai elections, but uh, yeah, from a strategic perspective um, uh, on China's behalf. Uh, that is that is a, a, something that would be very useful, and also um, on an economics level, people were asking in the chat why Malaysia uh, would be convinced to go to war with China. Well, uh, Singapore receives a lot of its uh, economy through merchant traffic, and if you build a detour right in Thailand, that's going to severely reduce the economic prospects of of Malaysia and, and Singapore, right? So in Indonesia, I should say, right. Um, so that's why you would, um, that's why you could get th- these other countries to, to conceivably go to war with a much larger China um, because of the economics, right? Because if China basically gets all of this merchant traffic to just ignore all of the you know, Indonesia and all of you know, Malaysia, like that's, you know, merchant fees that's um you know every time you send a ship through one of these straits you're gonna have like um uh like a harbor master or something who who tags along on on a vessel to make who knows the area right um and so you know it just it means that okay we're we're going to reduce the economic prospects for these countries right here and if you're making maximal claims to the economic zone right here, which includes fishing, which includes oil, which includes all sorts of resources. Um, and you're also taking away their main source of income through, through international trade by just detouring all of this oil traffic through the crawl straight or crawl canal that they want to build. Um, I mean, you're basically just throwing up a massive middle finger to all these countries here and just by ignoring them basically. Uh, to, to bring up yeah. Semyagog's point about Thailand, yeah, there were recent elections. It seems that the reformists may have been in the lead. It still hasn't been decided who the clear winner is because Thailand historically has, of course, issues with a more stronger military portion in its government. So there is potential, and keep your eyes out on this, uh, for domestic turmoil inside of Thailand as its reformist parties try and lead a stronger opposition for more civilian control of the government versus the military, which could be taken advantage of by larger powers in the area. But that's all I had to add. Yeah. <laughs> all kinds of larger <laughs> powers are doubtless uh, are doubtless sharpening their knives b- b- behind their various parties, you know, in that election. So I'd, I'd expect some to learn something about whether or not anything's going to happen with that crawl canal after, uh, after this period and you know the dust having settled another thing that uh, china can count on um is just that closing the straits of malacca to china creates all kinds of uh, issues for everyone else so it's like how long could um the let's just say in a hypothetical scenario the united states wants to really punish punish china so they 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 close the straits of malacca how how long could they do that for um, you know, without just screwing up, up the economies of just many, many other nations. Um, one of the ways that you could get around it would be to transit, you know, around Australia, which would take longer and add expense and still cause all kinds of economic uh, problems. But uh, but that'd be a, a way to avoid the region uh, entirely for the duration of the hostilities. But for that, Australia would have to um, begin to, uh, would have to develop further uh, in terms of its blue water navy and its submarine forces, in order to be able to protect those routes, so you know, yeah. in, in cooperation with the U.S. 
Yeah, like we mentioned before with uh, the the shipping issue, um, if you detour people out of the Strait of Malacca, you can't, like, because of the restrictions in the Sunda Strait, you have to go all the way around to Lombok and the Makassar and, and you know, the, the Sulu Sea over by the Philippines on, on the west side. Um, that's a detour of, like, thousands of kilometers, right? So that's going to increase fuel usage. That's going to increase the cost of, of you know, of shipping, um, and so when you start thinking about like old school maritime uh, mercantilist economic warfare, like how are you, y- y- this is, that's an interesting question, right? Of how long could you sustain like a conflict if this area, you know, went hot, right? Because you, you got to think, okay, all of these Gulf states, Iran, all of these oil producing states in the Middle East are now going to be a little bit you know, ticked with whoever is fighting here because, oh, you know, they're taking a a loss economically. So, you know, I mean, mean, it it just, you you start thinking about like, okay, the Belt and Road Initiative, they might, if you you actually did go hot, you might actually strengthen ties between Iran and Pakistan and and China, you know. Uh. Yeah, and this is something, of course, when we mentioned going around Australia, this has been something that has been on the concern of Australian policymakers minds alongside their security concerns. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute in 2019, this was something that I had brought up in my research was that, you know, their concern, of course, was uh, the growth of the Malacca Strait as China continues to grow its presence inside of the India Ocean. Um, This is the big game changer that they see for strategic interests, especially in the Indian Ocean, as that will be a large part of the greater Chinese military presence in the coming years. Beijing's most crucial interest is the protection of its trading routes, which over around 82% of its imported oil needs are transported from the Middle East and Africa. These sea lanes are highly vulnerable to threats from state and non-state adversaries, especially at the so-called maritime choke points, such as the Strait or Hormuz and the Malacca Strait. Um, and Australia's concern would be, of course, to uh, integrate its relationship with Japan and India to do so. Uh, for instance, right now, Japan works closely with India as a key regional partner, including building infrastructure on India's Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which lie uh, astride the western end of the Malacca Strait at the entrance to the Indian Ocean. Uh, Japan's also been a large provider elsewhere in the region, including um, Myanmar. And Australia is looking towards uh, increasing their relationships between the two areas. And this policy paper paper recommends uh, Australia, India, and Japan um, engage in ongoing trilateral. This is really before the uh, the quad really took off for what it is. But that the Indian Ocean is going to be the large portion for Australian concerns. And any sort of trade that's going to be messed with here uh, needs to be seriously considered. And as I talked about last week, if you were uh, tuned into that lecture... Um, we always have to consider the idea of trade expectation theory. Um, we don't know how stable trade expectation is to be. And any significant disruption to one of these choke points, like Mandrill was saying, could significantly lead to an increase in uh, hostilities because all of a sudden you've just decided to mess with where 82% of all international trade into China goes through. Uh, that would sure as hell get any country to defend its interests and, you know, not just rattle their sabers, but withdraw them from their sheaths. So it's a, an important area for us to, to discuss in this specific concern here. Um, but is there anything else that you two gentlemen wanted to add? And I, I, I feel like there's just so much more to dive into. Yeah, this could easily be like a three or four hour stream on its own, but we don't have that kind of time today. Um, um, I mean, what else could I add here? Um, I think I think I've pretty much given my take, honestly. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. We should just keep our eye on the region, um, and in particular, we should be watching the uh, Chinese efforts to reach out to these various countries, sub rosa, or you know, unostentatiously, in order to you know hang the carrot and uh, and wag the stick in order to bring them into line it's been a successful approach they've been doing it since the dawn of time and uh as uh, was pointed out earlier in the discussion the um very significant chinese minority populations in many of these places um are are doubtless uh, an important part of that 
Absolutely. And I mean, I think the other thing too that you had mentioned earlier, Semi Agog, is that you can't just fixate on one particular region. Um, you know, we, we consider the fact that there are um, permanent military bases, for instance, in Djibouti. You've got a, a large concern about defending, uh, you know, their SLOCs, right? Their ability to make sure they have access to these sea lanes. There's anti-piracy measures, which of course is the gray zone, which could easily be transformed into wartime utilities. And so, you know, you have outside regions uh, in Myanmar, of course, the relationship with ports in Pakistan, and now, of course, there are growing relationships inside of Saudi Arabia and Iran with recent right. diplomatic and visitation. Sri Lanka as well, um, yes. And uh, ports in um, or countries in Europe have signed deals with uh, the Chinese for their ports. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Greece is, uh, is one of them. Uh, and also there was an attempt to roll forward a program to make a canal north of the Panama Canal in Nicaragua, I think it was, I can't remember. Um, very similar to what we just, uh, what, what uh, Mandrel brought up, you know, with the Crawl Canal. So yeah, just to reinforce your point, Prude, that we, we have to keep an eye on, this, this, this game is global. Yeah, this is not uh, just localized to one area. Um, you know, the, it was proposed several years ago that Nicaragua Canal it was one of their, uh, you know, it was a um, it was a contract for it, I think, which was expired. I think sometime in like 2019. But yeah, uh, they did break some, they did break some ground and things for it, but then it just completely died. Last I looked. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things that just like happened right before the coup, and then I just haven't seen a lot of news on it elsewhere. Um, and I mean, I didn't even talk about it when I did my lecture on you know Chinese investment in Central and South America. Just there hadn't been a lot of news on it outside of uh, Wang Jing's, uh, you know, industrialist desire to build the Grand Nicaragua Canal costing like $40 billion, but it's kind of just died down. But it, it does illustrate, right, that for all this talk that we've had in the past, Semiagong, that you and I have talked about with like deglobalization or more stratified economy, what we mean by stratification in this instance is just like you have to carve out where you can get around these other blocks of investment sanctions and uh, presence of opposing military forces. And this is really what it looks like is, is that, you know, we, for instance, we talk about like what the strategic importance of Taiwan last week, guys. And what did we, we talked about, you know, the uh, semiconductors chips and, you know, one of the largest, um, you know, exporters of uh, electronic goods and services in the world. And so, you know, uh, the United States enjoys a really nice relationship for rare earth mineral mining with Australia. Well, how does the Chinese get around that? Well, you start looking at things like the lithium triangle in, in Central and South America. You start looking at how to build canals to get around the naval presence of other countries and alliances of other opposing sea lanes and defending your own sight lines and sea access. And that's what this stuff looks like. So this small little discussion about one of the most important shipping lanes in the world uh, also is indicative of the backdrop of this greater geopolitical, um, you know, power play that, that, you know, these things happen as old as time. Sea lanes were fought over during, you know, the early modern period when it came to European exploration. And we're going to see that sort of thing happen again in a much more globalized and stratified economy and uh, militarized state. Yeah, um, I have one quote here uh, just to, to finish off uh, my take of the stream and to reinforce uh, the importance of this place. Um, right. So everybody who understands the, the history of Malacca understands that, you know, the, the Portuguese took it from the, the Muslim uh, sultanate there in the early 1500s. And so there's a quote here uh, that he has, um, which is, if they were only to take Malacca out of the hands of the Moors, Cairo and Mecca would be entirely ruined, and Venice would then be able to obtain no spiceries except what her merchants might buy in Portugal. Um, so that just tells you this this region and this little tiny, tiny seaway in the world is such an incredibly important vector for global trade and has been for 500 years. It, it is of strategic importance, and everybody has an interest in in getting their hand in the cookie jar, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, Agreed. I, mean, I wholeheartedly agree there. Uh, so, 
that will probably be the end for uh, the lecture discussion portion for this. I'm, of course, going to have uh, our, our guests answer any questions and your takes on the geopolitical matters from the super chats that I saw roll in both here and on Entropy. But before I roll into announcements in Frog of the Week, I am going to uh, put our lovely guests uh, just sort of behind in the studio for about 70 seconds. Uh, we do have a, um, a sponsored uh you know, that we'd like to, to bring up and to illustrate with you guys. I think it's a really good thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have taken it on. So I'm going to just remove you two gentlemen real quick. Uh, and I'm going to add the video to stream here. And um, I hope that you all appreciate what these guys are doing. So the uh, today's video sponsor is from a lovely group of people. And I'm going to just pause it right here so these guys have bigger access. Um, is from a lovely group of people called Commonplace. I've actually started using this app. These guys are young, fresh entrepreneurs that are a social media app for readers to connect and discuss all things in respects to literature. Uh, Commonplace is a great place to simplify the process of saving your reading moments, quotes, books, parts of texts. Using your camera's phone with just a few clicks, you too can capture the reading excerpts and quotes and add personal annotations and commentary effortlessly. Uh, you no longer have to just rely on pen and paper or screenshotting parts of your book and say hello to organized and accessible digital libraries with your favorite passages. You can follow your friends on there, see their quotes and annotations, and you can also, of course, follow them, like their posts and commentaries, and set up reading groups and discussions and discuss the same passages together. Um, these discussion posts are modeled after other social media websites like Facebook, Reddit, and Goodreads for a wide range of conversation topics. Whether you're looking to ask for a reading schedule for your own book club or to share your thoughts on the author's background, possibilities, of course, are endless for literary discussion. Uh, Commonplace takes quotes and creates a digital library for some of your favorite reading moments. Um, I've begun to use it on my own phone and on the web to discuss the recent book that we had on our patron book club, Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind. Uh, I've also got a variety of discussions going on there. You can sign up down below with the App Store link as well as visit their website at commonplaceapp.com. Uh, so they want you to join, take a look at how you can benefit your own reading uh, resources. And of course, your feedback on the app would be greatly appreciated. So by all means, commonplaceapp.com. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, dealing with our lovely little sponsor there. Um, they approached me not too long ago, showed me how the app works. I really thought that it was worthwhile. These guys are starting something new. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I will take a sponsorship from some good old boys wanting to build an app for literature and reading over the nine or ten emails I've gotten for some obscure Chinese exercise bike. So. Uh, oh were, yeah, I got, I yeah. got those for the bike. <laughs> um, so you'll never see anything like a Chinese exercise bike or Raid Shadow Legends on my channel, but something that promotes literature, learning, and is built by guys here in America that actually want to increase our ability to communicate with literature and to appreciate uh, and take advantage of our technology to improve our learning and understanding the world. Uh, that wholeheartedly has my support. So uh, with that, we are going to get to announcements, news, frog of the week, and some shilling. So um, before I go into the super chat portion and the frog of the week here, uh, are there any pieces of streams, works, avenues, discussions that either of you two gentlemen have going on that you want the audience to know about? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, when I am not doing Substack for uh, my own uh, Substack channel and uh, YouTube stuff uh, for videos and that sort of thing, uh, I do work for the Old Glory Club, which you can check out their articles and streams on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays uh, on either their YouTube channel or their Substack. Um, yeah, I'm 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 kind of turning my channel into a gaming channel when I don't actually have uh, of content, and you know I just put out a, an article on Harry Potter on my Substack, you know, as a as a millennial reflecting on on his own generational culture. Um, uh, so yeah, I I do that kind of stuff. So check it out. Send me a gog. What have you been it up to? Uh, well, I have uh, I have a stream coming up. Uh, didn't have anything this week, so apologies to uh, folks on that, but I have one coming up next Thursday, the 25th. I'll be talking with a uh, Panama hat, at least a uh, Panama hat. We might have another person join in, but we'll be discussing uh, the lives of uh, certain poets that are interesting. It'll we'll, we'll basically, you know, rather than looking at the poetry, we'll look at the way uh, particular poets lived um, and the crazy shit that they got up to once upon a time. Very likely people like uh, Francois Villon or Villon, um, Checo Angiolieri, uh, Byron, 
uh, and many others who uh, had just very interesting lives in their own right. It should be a uh, a cozy, chill discussion. And then uh, the following uh, Thursday, uh, June first, I'm going to be appearing on someone else's channel. I'll I'll, I'll post a, a link to it when it rolls through, but it will be on the uh, overlap uh, between dancing and fighting, or more specifically, ways in which uh, dance training. Um, and skill development can be applied uh, in fighting and developing uh, skill with uh, fighting. It, it, we've clearly seen that sort of thing illustrated with uh, with Lomachenko, you know, a famous uh, Ukrainian boxer who has a background uh, in dance as well, which no doubt contributes to his uh, amazing uh, footwork and nimbleness. Other than that, I have uh, uh, two streams in the works. Uh, they haven't been scheduled yet, but one will be a discussion of reincarnation with uh, Philosophicat. And the other one that I'm uh, also looking forward to very much, still has to be scheduled, will be a discussion with uh, Marhobani, Robert Daigen, uh from South Africa, very bright guy, uh, researcher. Um, we'll be discussing... Uh, the idea of whites as a minority and what that entails, um, something that, you know, we should be thinking uh, more about, it seems, in our day. So, yeah, that's that's uh, that's all for me at the moment. Thanks for uh, giving me a, a chance to mention it, Prude. Yeah, anytime. Absolutely. You guys are some of my favorite people to talk to online. I want to make sure that people are following you, reading your work, and seeing where you guys are at. Their lovely links are down below in the description. So, um, by all means, give our good friends a follow on Twitter, Substack, YouTube, and elsewhere. And I'm going to go share the screen and just make sure that I can get our lovely announcements Frog of the Week out of the way. And then we'll answer your super chance and we'll wrap up here. Um, so, slideshow. So, by all means, be sure to sign up with Commonplace. I think that it's a great idea that people want to take the best parts of Goodreads and book club discussion and make that something uh, to work. And, of course, as they've told me, they want your feedback. These are some guys that are just fresh out of the university uh, here in America, and they want to make something that actually works for you uh, for book clubs and for literary discussion. So, by all means, give it a chance to check it out. Um, I was recently on Pete Quinones. We just talked about uh, Mr. Ted Kaczynski's um, 2011 article, Why Industrial Society Will Collapse, it was a fun little over an hour long discussion and commentary. Um, speaking of commentary, I will be finishing up on Joseph Sobrin's essay, Notes for the Reactionary of Tomorrow. Part two will be out later this week. Um, my patron book club, which I mentioned earlier, covered part, we just covered the first half of Alan Bloom's 1987 Closing of the American Mind. That will be on Subscribestar, uh, YouTube channel memberships, and uh, Substack as well. I think it's already out on Substack right now. Um, the Digital Archipelago will be reviewing the 2012 film, The Place Beyond the Pines, and a 1973 article on violence. And then I'll have a new video dropping on the 31st of this month. And then I'm also going to have some patron exclusive foreign affairs article reading and review and research for you all this week as well. So um, plenty of stuff coming down in the works, but it's going to be a writing heavy uh, week this week pending any uh, guest appearances or anything like that. But so far, I've got nothing on the uh, agenda with you all here. So uh, with that, we'll get to Frog of the Week. <laughs> All right, this week's wonderful frog of the week is the Boreal Chorus Frog. It's a Canadian native. It's typically found all the way from um, British Columbia all the way down to Quebec, although it can be found as far south as Utah. It's one of those little smaller chorus frogs that are usually about an inch length in total, of course, being a sexually dimorphic species. The females are larger than the males. Um, and you will find them usually in cleared land in forested areas, but always around a permanent body of fresh water. Uh, whose mating calls can be heard from April to through September with a large reeing sound with a strong K at the end. Uh, and unlike other species of chorus frogs, these guys are a little bit shorter in the legs, but have stronger toe pads for climbing through grasses and other tall foliage. 
Um, and then, of course, um, unlike other frog species that are losing their habitats due to uh, deforestation or industrialization, these guys are actually the most vulnerable towards uh, fungal infections. But this is uh, the Boreal Chorus Frog, this Frog of the Week. I'd like to thank my <laughs> patrons who helped me uh, keep track of these guys so I don't ever accidentally repeat one. Uh, says there are over 5,000 species of frogs. It's a shame on me for ever repeating one on air. So um, Frog of the Week is back, fellas. We're good there. Um, but now we get to catch up with you lovely people and whoops, uh, see how everyone's doing. But I do want to thank my top tier patrons first, Fearless Leader, Preservatism, Mr. Raging Mandrill himself, Fokron, User 4A, 5B, 5D, B5, Consumer, Hunger, Cowering Bugman, Winston Fujimori, Lavanius, and Voluble Ox. These lovely people uh, donate $20 or more a month on the subscribe star whose support I am very thankful for in the long run. And uh, patronage goes a long way. It's why we also support friends on this channel like Semyagog, who I'm a patron of. And that's what we do around here is friends. B -b 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 based. <laughs> so uh, that's what we do around here. So there were um, a couple of super chats sent on uh, uh, Entropy, but also Glow in the Dark. I said, no super chats for $2. And I said, no, there is... Um, there will be super chats over on uh, Entropy. So there's the pinned comment in the chat as well as down below in the description. If you want to ask us questions, it's always encouraged, but it's not always uh, required. Um, but your support does go a long way. Uh, so the ones over on Entropy. Uh, glow in the dark for $10 US says, yes, uh, China and Biden could have planned out this Ukraine scenario to push Russia and China together. But I've read plenty of papers about causing Russia and China to fight each other by eliminating Russia's access to the Mediterranean or straight up cause color revolution could just be self-inflicted. Uh, yes, I think we all kind of have this. Uh, you, Semi Agog, I think more than anyone has been very adamant on sort of the China-Biden connection, which I think definitely requires a good discussion one of these days. Yeah, it's just a raw speculation on my part. It's just, you know, if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, and every single thing it does seems to help China. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, that, that's just it's my it's my favorite hypothesis, sheer speculation. And I do not claim it as uh, as fact, certainly. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if this is I don't think that there would be an intentional desire to push Russia and China together. I mean, one of those key lynching points of the American foreign policy since Nixon has been trying to take advantage of a Sino-Soviet split. And it seems that whatever America's policy towards Russia and Ukraine has been, seems to have been um, bringing the two closer together in respects to intelligence sharing and economic interdependence and taking advantage of Russia's natural resource economy with respects to crude oil and petroleum exports, which if we were to look up right now, you'll find it's a hefty majority of Russian exports to China uh, alongside some manufactured goods, but not enough in comparison to Russian imports from Chinese goods. Uh, yeah, there's also Iran, which is just a huge question mark for me because the 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 power of the Israeli lobby is something that you know we're all aware of, and you don't have to get involved with crazy conspiracy theories about it. Um, it's just you know what's it's just visible a very above powerful the, lobby. Absolutely, what's visible above the surface of the water, you know, in terms of APAC and influence, um, is is very very clear, and yet this whole thing has driven. Um, uh, Russia and Iran together. And you would imagine that people would be concerned about that as well. And yet we did it. And that helps China. As I said, it helps Iran. Uh, it helps uh, Russia in certain uh, respects. So I just, it's a bit much for me to imagine that this is just a, some self-inflicted, you know, result of a, of a diplomatic oversight. There are enough interested parties involved and like you said, a long enough standing um, general great game strategic policy on the United States to, you know, to split uh, China and Russia. It's been established for a, quite a long time. I, I can't imagine that somebody did, did not, many somebodies, uh, I can't imagine that many people have not uh, squawked loudly about this and its implications. There's no way that somebody... That, that these deci decisions were made uh, without people discussing their interests, for example, like APAC and the, their concerns about Iran, which I'm sure must have been 
uh, voiced. So I, I just I can't imagine it's self-inflicted. And so what I'm forced to do is speculate as to, well, what could the explanation be? And the idea that uh, Biden is in some respect compromised just doesn't seem all that outlandish to me, given the fact pattern. Yeah, there's some, um, like I've mentioned before in this stream, um, it's interesting from the Sino-Soviet split, right, of why because Kissinger's still alive, right? He's still giving advice to people, like in like that was kind of his his baby back in the day, in like the seventies. Yeah. So it's it's interesting from a a geopolitical brass tax realist perspective of, of thinking, okay, well, if you if you want to go after communist or nominally communist China, you know, why would you? Why would you piss off Russia? Why would you not want Russian friendship or Russian participation? Well, of course, there's costs to that, right? Because, of course, if you want Russia to be your friend, you're going to have to offer something in return. And what is Russia going to want in return? Well, it's going to want very specific concessions in certain places. Um, and it's just it's really odd to see the United States like think that it can take on China and, and Russia at once. It's very strange very strange yeah and i mean the the point about the mediterranean is is very uh is a valid strategic interest i mean this is why uh you've got turkey and greece despite their long-standing ethnic issues i mean there are still songs in greek that are sung and memorized about the fall of constantinople um in comparison to dealing with the seljuk turks but you know they're both members of nato and then you also have the you know Montreux Convention of 1936 that's been in play here. I, I but I would, you know there's no mention of of course the, the Baltics. Uh, there's no concern there about respects to uh, Kaliningrad and sort of this isolated large territorial base. Of course, and on side of uh, its naval waters, you've got Kaliningrad and then of course uh, Kronstadt to, to also be concerned with. But I it's still it's an area that. We, we need to continue to pay attention to. I don't think for the, the time being, less there's a major disruption in natural resources or say something happens to the Strait of Malacca, right, where you're going to see a lot of change happen between Russia and China's current relationship as it is. Um, but, you know, America has, the USG has been adamant about trying to change regimes inside Russia, but so far with no degree of success. Um, so yeah, but glow in the dark sends another super chat for $3 us. He says, I hear Thailand was subverted by a USA candidate. So maybe India became redundant. Billions were given to the reform party. Indonesia would probably cooperate with the United States. Uh, I don't think you can really underestimate. Uh, there's no way that the United States views India as redundant. Uh, you don't just ignore a nuclear powered and a nuclear armed state with a population of over a billion people that you, uh, nominally have stronger relationships with than say other Asiatic countries that have a much larger degree of influence with China in respects to their economies. I mean, let's not forget that uh, despite having one summit in, in the United States, the association of Southeast Asian nations receives, you know, more attention from the Chinese than anywhere else. Uh, you know, the real question just does matter what kind of happens from that Thai Thailand election, but uh, Indonesia and India, of course, are still going to be very important with respects to, uh, any sort of a policy the USG puts forward in this instance. I, I can't imagine that you would ever view India as redundant towards Asiatic policy, not especially with the Quad. And it's the fact it's a nuclear power that doesn't get along with China or uh, Pakistan in this respects. But, you know, that's just uh, my layman's opinion. Um, but yeah, uh, and Kissinger is more moderate on Russia geo in that, in that respect. And if he lives for another seven days, if he makes it to next Saturday, everybody, he will be a hundred years old. Uh, so keep that in mind in the back of your book. Um, but if you're going to read anything on Kissinger, um, Scroto, uh, I would start with anything that you, before anything you read on Kissinger, like his later work, do read his doctoral dissertation. Or I think it's his doctoral dissertation on Clemens von Metternich. That man is probably one of the most well-read gentlemen on Metternich as a scholar and a historian. He understands uh, realism and balance of power very well. I mean, for all, all the people that say he's evil and whatnot, there's some very valid criticisms that you can levy against Kissinger, but read his uh, biography and historiography of Clemens von Metternich and then read his 
uh, world order book. It has certainly aged a bit, but it does illustrate sort of the differing world systems uh, or sort of the power block systems. He's kind of a continuation of the clash of civilizations in a lot of respects. So those would be the two books of Kissinger I would read on Metternich and on the world order. Um, but if either of you two gentlemen have anything to say on Kissinger, by all means, hop in. Not a word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'll just say something on Kissinger. Um, Yeah, I mean, to to address Gio's point in further depth, I mean, and the point I was trying to make is like, because the Sino-Soviet split was was kind of um, something that was kind of Kissinger's baby, uh, like it's it's odd for to conceive that he wouldn't see things also or be able to see things the other way. And, and think, okay, well, I don't have to be like allies militarily with Russia, but it, it, if you're going to have any sort of confrontation with China, military or economic or, or whatever, you're going to need at least at minimum Russian neutrality and to make sure that those two are not like buddy, buddy, right? So from a realist perspective, yeah, like that's, that's just, you know, brass tacks there, you know? So I, I, I would be very, even, you know, Kissinger being, you know, very elderly now, I, I, I fail to see that he would, he would, you know, not like, you know, have uh, overlook that. <laughs> the Venture Brothers actually got Kissinger right. Yeah, some sort of uh, non-human, uh, you know, Lovecraftian like entity that helps people embrace their inner evil. Uh, I actually want to talk about that show on stream one of these days. I have, I have a lot of. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on it. But uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, one last time, Mr. Mandrill, Mr. Semyagog, where can people find you and where should they follow you best? Uh, you, they can find me on YouTube, on uh, BitChute, on Telegram, on Twitter, uh, and on Odyssey uh, at a minimum. And I suggest they uh, do so uh, in all those places. And uh, thanks, thanks very much for having me on. Great to talk to you, Prude, and great to talk to you as well, Mandrill. Mr. Mandrill. Um, well, likewise, Semigog. And um, yeah, I should probably mention also, uh, I do have all of my content backed up on Odyssey as well. So if you want to follow me on Odyssey, I am, I am present there uh, to make sure that any of my work doesn't get uh, deleted uh, arbitrarily. Um, and again, of course, I'm on Substack. I'm on Twitter. I'm on all, all the places you can find me on Gab and all of that stuff. And, you know, so uh, I'm not exactly a hard man to find online. You just got to look. Yep, and their Find My Friends links are down below in the description. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Much gratitude to my guests for joining me on this uh, important discussion on uh, one of our favorite subjects, which of course is geography. Um, Semiagog and I are are men, well, Mr. Mandrill too, we're all men who love our maps. So uh, here we are there in that respects. So of course, be sure to try out and sign up with Commonplace down below. I think it's a great way for you to enjoy your literature and to take advantage of your phone's ability to capture and record texts for great conversations on literature and more. Uh, be sure to follow these two fine gentlemen down below. Your ongoing support via Subscribestar, Buy Me a Coffee, the merchandise via Teespring, as well as Substack, goes a very long way in maintaining the channel's operations and the things that I get to do. So your ongoing and continued support there is always interested. As low as $2 a month, you get access to early access videos, uh, private research and recordings, as well as a monthly book club that you guys get to suggest and participate in. No matter how you do it as low as two dollars a month your support's greatly appreciated uh and with that we will see you all this thursday live on my channel and we'll be back here next week same time on saturday uh taking a look at what else is going on in the world see you gents <laughs>